We have here the first question in the back. Thank you. Thank you, Marit from uh, MSF. Um, I have a question for Gabriela. Why, in the context of elimination uh, in Cambodia, why have you chosen for a 28-day follow-up and not for a 42-day follow-up to really... I mean, the ones that would come back after so many weeks are, will probably be the most resistant ones. Um, so why have you chosen for 28-day follow-up? It was a... In, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. It was an operational question, um, let's say request I need, because uh, we wanted to, um, well, acknowledging that uh, day 42 or even day 63 uh, is even better to understand uh, uh, <coughs> about a treatment failure. Also, we are aware that in a context of multidrug resistance, uh, if we lose the patient in follow-up, uh, then uh, it can spread the further artemisinin resistance. So we wanted to uh, ensure that the day 28 <coughs> was there to catch as soon as possible any possible uh, recrudescence of infection and treat it with second light treatment. And then we have this lady in the white shirt here. She was microphone for her, perhaps. Hi, Kate from MSF. My question's for Ruby. In terms of the reactive hepatitis E vaccine, you mentioned the, the ideal point being 50 cases, but given there are so many asymptomatic hepatitis E cases, how is that in terms of practical implementation during outbreaks? Thanks. That's been taken into account. Um, it's the 50 sy symptomatic cases, so it's the cases that we would see in our clinics. Okay, next question. You, at, sorry, and then we go to, can we go? Yeah, Jeff from uh, MSF. So a question to both uh, David and Ruby uh, regarding the comment that was made previously to your presentation, David is that um, yeah, for operational decision, should we trust um, results from a mathematical model? Because if what you presented last time was out of a mathematical model, or should we, uh, at the end, wait a little bit and uh, try also to have more evidence and impact? So that's my question. Okay, shall I go first? Sure. Um, yeah, the, the work that we presented previously was a mathematical model um, showing that, um, that that we probably responded too late in Uganda with our water and sanitation response. But I agree that actually we need an opportunity where we, we actually respond much earlier with our water and sanitation response and see if it actually does have an impact. Um, we haven't seen that yet. All right, thank you. Um, as I was mentioning before, hepatitis E is an extremely challenging disease to, to study and to figure out the correlation uh, and causation issues involved with the interventions. Um, I, I think we have to react. We have to do something. And we know that the Watson uh, activities that we do have an effect for a lot of fecal oral diseases. Uh, and so our, our best assumption is that these are the right things to do uh, for the, in this context as well. Um, we, we tried to react quite quickly in Chad uh, to put these programs in place after we had uh, just 20, 30 cases. We were moving quickly to put these programs in place. Uh, and so hopefully what we did uh, had, a, had a, an effect, and I, I think that it did. Um, and then I just wanted to also say that we, we talked about the vaccine in Chad. It's something that's kind of on everybody's radar, but uh, it's not available yet, not approved in that context, um, not WHO pre-approved, and so it's not something that we were able to implement quite quickly. But if any one of you hears of a hepatitis E outbreak, think about a vaccine study, okay? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you here at the back. Uh, hello, thank you. This is Hilary. I'm from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I'm afraid it's another question for David. Um, a really nice presentations on, on hepatitis uh, E and actually all the presentations. My question would be is, are you able to put in the dates at which you introduced the hygiene kits, the various water um, interventions? Because I, I mean, I guess I didn't realize 
quite how long the incubation period would be, but if you were able to do that on your epi curve, you might be able to see a l something interesting or not. Yeah, great question. I think the the interesting thing that I saw in the project relating to that epi curve was how contextual it is. Um, some of the spikes early on relate to the weeks that we started surveillance. You know, so when you hire 180 people to walk around the city looking for jaundice cases, you you find lots of patients. Um, likewise, at the end, when you start wrapping up your programs, if there's still jaundice pa patients, you may miss them. So that's the first comment. And then the second is, um, yeah, we, we gave out these kits in early December. By, uh, by around the same time, we had had uh, full water chlorination programs up. Um, and so, you know, six weeks later, we were hoping that the cases dropped. They were still, they were still high for another uh, month or so. So w where that, what that means exactly in terms of the incubation period being an average of six weeks, um, it's hard to say. There, there's, of course, this issue of secondary transmission as well. So uh, you, you may be having continuing transmission between the population, even if you've stopped uh, transmission through the water supply. Um, I think you were the first, and then we go come to you later. Hang on. Can you give this gentleman the microphone? <coughs> Burn MSF uh, Manson units. Uh, my question is um, to Amadou. Um, so can you just explain to us how whether there was a conversation when you were deciding to have a um, a placebo-controlled trial, um, given that there are other, uh, um, other vaccines that have been shown um, to work elsewhere, and, and whether you could have considered um, comparing those vaccines, uh, um, and, and maybe not, I don't know whether it's always the case to look at the severe cases, but whether other vaccines would have allowed you to look at other um, impacts that, apart from just the severe cases. Thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I just want to let you know that while, uh, by the time we, were, we started this, the study, there was no any other vaccine, rotavirus vaccine available in Niger. There was not at all using it in the EPI program. And the second point is also because of these existing vaccines are not perfect, the, the sample size would be massive. Also, then this is the second point. And that's why we, we compare it to, to the placebo and have a real, the, the, the real vaccine efficacy of the BRVPV. Okay, who is next? There in the back, sorry, who was there? There, here. Yeah, you with the blue shirt. Thank you. Uh, my name is Oscar uh, from MSF uh, Canada. Uh, my question goes to uh, Amadou Sek. Uh, most of the time in Africa, we have uh, uh, vaccination campaigns where uh, different vaccines are being combined. And I don't know what would be the possibility of combining a rotavirus uh, vaccine with other vaccines, if it, there is a potential of accepting that combination. Thanks. Well, the secondary objectives regarding the interaction of the vaccine and the the, the vaccine used at, at present time in the, in the EPI program is ongo are ongoing. But uh, if you look at the, the inclusion date uh, period, we start from six weeks up to 14 weeks. And the aim is also, also to introduce this, this BRVPV vaccine in the, in the EPI programs in, in, these, in these settings. And yeah, we are still awaiting the, these results. But if we consider the, the existing vaccines, there was no interaction with the OPV or other vaccines used in the EPI program uh, found with the other rotavirus vaccines. Now we are still awaiting, and hopefully maybe someday we'll be able to, to, to introduce this in, in these national programs. Thank you. Okay, next question, who has one? Um, the lady with the black shirt was the first one I saw, but keep your questions. <laughs> Don't despair, you come. Your, your time will come, for sure. 
Uh, hi, I'm Charlotte from the London School. Um, I've got a question for Amadou. Um, you said about uh, HIV status and um, whether the mother was breastfeeding. Um, I was just wondering, um, firstly, did you collect that data on each of the um, subjects? And then if you did, have you had a chance to adjust the efficacy for those? And if so, Excuse me, could you just... Um, sorry. Um, did you um, collect data on HIV status and um, breastfeeding? And if you have... Um, did you, have you had a chance to adjust for that, for the efficacy? Well, we, we have performed HIV tests on these participating children. And also we have a subgroup of, of mother, pregnant women, who are included in a sub-study. Sub, sub and we are following all the, the data relating to these, to these mothers and also the vaccine efficacy on, on, on the children. As you know, the, the rotavirus vaccine have low efficacy in, in developing countries, and we have lots of, we assume that maybe lots of causes are, are, could justify this. But once again, we have also, we are, the, the, the results are, are ongoing, but you, you're right, we, 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 are, we are waiting for these results, and we consider the breastfeeding, the, the HIV status, malnutrition, other other enteric infections in, in such in these settings. And maybe in a couple of months we'll have all these answers. Thank you. You are the next year. Hi, um, I'm Geraldine O'Hara. I'm a infectious diseases physician in the NHS. My question's for the HEPI experts on the panel, and it may be a display of my ignorance. As I understand it, the vaccine's based on genotype one. Are we certain that it has the same protective efficacy across all the genotypes? Um, it's, yeah, it's based on genotype one, but the study, it was actually in a setting that's mainly genotype four. So yeah. it was effective against genotype four and genotype one. Um, it's ex to, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, but it's expected to be, have um, effect on all four genotypes. Okay, next question. Uh, you, I think, were the next. Sorry, I hope I. Okay. Thomas Dennison from MSF here again. Ruby, I have another question about the vaccine model. So, you pointed out that in the, tri in the Chinese trial, uh, that a single dose was not effective. Um, I'm just wondering whether in the reactive setting, in the outbreak setting, where you can expect a much higher frequency of effective infectious contacts and where long-term immu immunity may not be such a priority, whether it will be worth it or whether any modeling has been done on the effect of a single, on a single, of a single dose? Yeah, that's a really good question. We, we wanted to explore uh, single-dose vaccination. Um, apparently, the, the, we actually approached the authors of that paper for single-dose uh, effectiveness um, data. They don't have it. They're, um, study was empowered to look at that. Um, so it would be something that's worth looking at in, a, in an outbreak setting and exploring that. All right. I'm afraid we are coming to an end here. Um, thank you very much to the, to the panel. Thank you very much for your excellent presentations. And thank you very much to all of you for staying to the end. Thank you. Thank you.